U.S. Chamber of Commerce says India continues to fall behind others on patent protection. In fact, they've ranked India 43 out of 45 countries on the Intellectual Property Rights Index, and that's below countries like China, Kenya, Vietnam, among others. What are the reasons behind such a poor ranking for India? To discuss that, we're now joined by the author of the report, Patrick Kilbride. Patrick, appreciate you joining us here on CNBC TV 18. To start with, uh, you know, this pretty much mirrors what your report said the previous year as well. I want to understand why there is a disconnect between how you rank India's performance on IPR and what we're hearing from the U.S. administration. For instance, the former ambassador, U.S. ambassador to India, Richard Varma, said that there's been a great degree of convergence on the IPR issue. Just yesterday, I was having conversations with the R&D heads of Novartis, GSK, etc., who are invested in India and are incrementally investing further in India, and they believe that things have improved significantly on the IPR front. Why is it that your report doesn't take cognizance of any of that? Well, thank you for having me, first of all. And, you know, there have been important changes in the IP environment in India led by the changed tone and rhetoric coming from the top, from the administration. And, you know, the national IPR policy that came out earlier this year made some very positive statements. The problem is with a tool like the index, we can't capture progress until it is institutionalized in law and in practice. So aspirational policies like the IPR policy are great, but we have to see the results. Okay. You know, on the specific issues, Patrick, and you talk about compulsory licenses, but let's just look at the data. Uh, you know, to date, India has only given out one compulsory licenses, and that process has, in fact, stood the scrutiny of the courts. So why this you know, constant sort of berating of the compulsory license true, regime we... in India. We're, we're having a little bit of trouble hearing you on our end, but I will say in terms of compulsory licenses that challenge uh, innovators and innovative industries face in India has been that the political rhetoric was such that every company in the innovative space believed that their product could be the next one to be uh, subject to a compulsory license. And the underlying statutory framework is conducive to compulsory licenses. So that creates a great deal of uncertainty. Hmm. And that's anathema to innovation. Uh, you know, but again, I, and I go back to data because I'm just taking a look at the data. Now, Indian courts have actually ruled in favor of foreign companies in IPR cases in 2015. An Indian company, which is Glenmark, lost a case against Merck in the highest court in India when it came to an anti-diabetes drug. Similarly, uh, when it was pointed out that CIPLA, which is an Indian company, had infringed, infringed upon Roche's anti-lung cancer drug, uh, the courts ruled in favor. So why this, this sort of uh, fear that, uh, that, that uh, India is going to treat this issue unfairly? It reflects the fact that India has continued to advocate in multilateral institutions like the United Nations, the WTO, the World Intellectual Property Organization, for liberal use of compulsory licenses as a tool. Uh, and what we've seen is that that has led to other markets adopting the same rhetoric, using compulsory licenses, if only as a threat against innovative companies to, in, uh, in price negotiations, for instance. And that's the kind of, uh, of rhetoric that just lends uncertainty to the markets, where what we need to see more long-term investment in uh, drug breakthroughs and new cures for disease mm. is long-term reliability. No, I understand that. But, you know, when you talk about uh, predictability and you talk about investments, uh, the concerns that you talk of don't seem to be reflected in investments into India. We've seen several joint ventures, not just in the pharmaceutical space, but let me focus specifically in the pharmaceutical space. In August 2015, Gilead announced eight additional licensing agreements with Indian pharma companies. AstraZeneca announced a core marketing deal with Indian companies. Amgen announced a deal with Dr. Reddy's. And even now, outside of pharma, whether it's the likes of Boeing, G, Honeywell, I mean, they're all setting up manufacturing facilities here in India, which is why I'm struggling to understand uh, where this disconnect comes from, the concerns that your report points out, uh, and the disconnect between 
actual investments in India? It's a great question because it speaks to the art of the possible. I think what we're seeing in India, the, the great interest from companies from all over the world is a reflection of India's promise and potential, but it could be just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, I think the world is looking for the next engine of economic growth, and it could be India. And our report, what it simply points out is that there are some very, fairly simple steps that India could take to buttress its intellectual property environment that would help it become the economic growth engine of the world for the next uh, decades. And we saw China do this uh, over the last two decades. We've seen the U.S. in this position before. We think it's India's turn, but we see from experience all over the world what kind of conditions are necessary to create that environment. And that's what our report speaks to, is the art of the possible. All right, the art of the possible. Well, uh, uh, you know, 2016 was a big year for FDI, for India, record FDI inflows. So uh, let's hope that uh, India moves up the rankings, at least in your index next year uh, when we speak. Patrick, appreciate you joining us here on CNBC TV 18. Uh, that's Patrick Kilbride taking us through the IPR index report that's been put together.